there was this whole dungeon that Watunski had. It was insane. Kevin Bacon was the victim. Right. He had met up with Latunsky via the Grinder app, gone to his house, and Latunsky had him, cut off his tails, and he goes upstairs, and he goes into his kitchen, and he fries them in a frying pan, and then eats them. The community is up in arms because of these two guys that had escaped previously. They're like, you know, you could have stopped this. Both of these were consensual, and both of these guys went back to stay with Mark Latunsky. Well, they tried to make a political thing out of it, and it really wasn't. How did the police end up at the house? Okay, so this is where I kind of like found myself in the middle of the story. Mark was a troubled person. He was. Um, Mark Latunsky, he went to high school at Morris High School, um, which is like south of Owasso in Shiawas County. Uh, he was a valedictorian of his graduating class. Um, he ended up having his IQ tested later and it was just astronomical. The guy was a genius. Um, he ended up getting was, the Unabomber was like a genius. I mean, he was well, too. Well, that's a very malleable word. Um, but he, he, there's no doubt he was intelligent. Um, he went to school for basic, he ended up working as a chemist for a couple different places. Um, Dow chemical. In Midland, that's one of the big ones. Um, that's one of the huge um, chemical companies. Um, this was up until about the late, mid to late 2000s, and he started acting just a little bit off. Um, he told his wife, well, this is the early stages. Um, he was how, how old, I'm sorry, how old was he then, do you think? Uh, he would have been... Roughly. About 40. Oh, okay. Late 30s or about 40. Um so he's working for Dow and he started telling his wife that, uh, you know, these people were poisoning his water supply, um, that his kids weren't really his, um, just a lot of conspiracy type stuff. And, um, late seems 2000s, almost, I'm sorry. That seems almost like it might be uh, a touch of, uh, uh, schizophrenia or something too. He, he was diagnosed as bipolar and schizophrenic in the late okay. 2000s. Um, during this time, late 2000s, he started to <clears throat> show some, and he had always been straight as far as I know. Um, he started to show some um, gay tendencies. He actually worked as a male escort um, down south of like Flint and in the Detroit metro area. He was on escort websites, all sorts of stuff. Um, then it kind of changed with him and his wife. Um, she filed for divorce. She's not going to put up with that, obviously. Um, then, like, he went, he went off his meds. He was fine as long as he was on his meds, but he refused to take them. So his wife was like, you know, I'm not dealing with this, filed for divorce. So they get divorced, and the wife gets, like, uh, primary physical custody of their kids. And they had, I think, three, two or three kids. And... um mm. It was 2012. He was charged with like custodial kidnapping, um, which is like a felony. Right. And he did. He didn't like kidnap his kids. He took them to a water park and didn't get them back in time. But they charged him. The wife, you know, and I'm not defending him. He shouldn't have done that. But basically, he was late getting them back, and he took them to a water park. So he takes kids back. <clears throat> his wife is adamant that they press charges, and they charged him with a felony for that. Basically, he got probation and the judge was like take your meds do this probation and we'll dismiss it at the end of probation and it was dismissed he did complete that successfully he did it long enough to complete probation and then stop taking his meds again. of course um so after he gets done with his probation he refuses to take his meds he's like i'm not crazy everybody else is crazy and he had the cops called to his house a bunch of times. Um, once he laid down in his driveway and pretended to be dead, and the cops came up to him and they're like, Mark, we know you're alive. Stop. And that happened like two or three times for separate occasions. Um, he married um, a guy, and I wouldn't use his name, but it's already public, and he's made public statements. He married a guy named Jamie Arnold. Okay. Jamie Arnold was a hairdresser in Flint. Now, Mark was kind of bouncing between jobs at this time, but uh, um, Mark still lived in the house that he had bought when he was married to his wife. Um, him and the husband, they were into, and man, I tell you, 
when I was reporting on this and researching it, I went down the rabbit hole. There are things I learned about that I didn't, I had no idea even existed. Um, but him and the husband were, they were doing the male escort thing and it was like BDSM. I don't even know what to call it because I'm frankly. What's that stand for? Bondage, dom, dominate, I, bondage, domination. Those are the only two I know. And there's more. Sadomasochism, I think. Yeah. That's that's it. That's it. Um, so him and his husband were involved in some pretty seedy stuff. And it was open marriage, obviously. They were both doing their own thing. Um, so Mark Latunsky got even more out there. Like um, Jamie Arnold. <laughs> he wasn't already pushing the envelope? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, that's to each his or her own, whatever. No judgment here. But uh, it was really hard, like learning about this when I was like in the middle of reporting out the story because I don't, I don't know any about any of this stuff. But they were out there. It's all over the internet. You can Google search Mark Latunsky's name, and you're going to see all sorts of stuff. Um, that we'll get into their particular fetishes later. But uh, right up until um, the murder, he was relatively. Up until his divorce, he was somewhat normal. Then he got kind of strange. Then he got married to this Jamie Arno guy and just went completely off the rails. So he he was troubled. Yeah, there's no question about that. Um so how so what was he doing for a living? Like he worked for a couple um he worked for Dow. And he worked for a couple other in a couple other similar positions. I don't know. I I, assume, I just kind of I think I kind of assumed that he didn't work there anymore. Once no. all this happened, I don't know why I, why I thought that. He he either I think he got fired because he was just acting weird at work. Um, this would have been. Plus, he thought everybody was poisoning him, and oh, he was convinced he was related to like Welsh royalty. And, and everything was a conspiracy and he had this trust worth bill, millions or billions of dollars in, in another name, which was his real name. But we'll get into that. Um, when we get into the case, the court case. Is that the, the um, Nigerian prince scam? <laughs> no, but it's similar. Uh, similar theme, yeah. Okay. All right. So he was so, okay. So he's still kind of off again, on again, working for various, as a, was it always as a chemical engineer or so either that or, you know, positions very similar to that. And, it, and it's kind of strange. He actually holds a couple patents that um, he gets residual income for, for things that he had done while he worked for Dow and some of these other companies, but he holds a couple patents. Cause I mean, he had a nice big house. Like it's, you know, in, I, I don't know what he, what the total amount he paid for that house and property was basically his entire extended family owns a lot of the block like out in rural michigan it's not like a city block you talk about a block it's like a huge chunk of land surrounded by roads which are the dividing lines for the property so his family has lived there for a long time and they own most of that block but he either bought it from a family member or something but i don't know how much he originally paid for it but i know that at the time that it was auctioned off it was he owed about a hundred and one hundred and two thousand dollars on it okay well i mean that's what he owed it would look like it was worth i mean in florida that thing would be worth easily half a million you know oh, yeah. more six hundred thousand hell in california it'd be worth three million. Oh yeah i lived in san diego for eight years yeah right um it, it is a nice piece of property and for anybody that didn't know what happened in that house you know hey it'd be a great purchase yeah <laughs> so um which is horrible that I'm laughing about that. I'm sorry. I, you know, I'm. It's in, in before we get any further, you know, at some point in time, I'm going to have to say exactly what happened in the murder. Right. And I want to be completely respectful to Kevin Bacon's family. I've met them. They're wonderful people, salt to the earth, humble, you know, and it's just a horrible thing to happen to them. But I want to be respectful to them, but, you know, also tell the story. Yeah. It, it, it listen, let's face it though, it's odd. Like I know they, they, it, the whole situation from, you know, from, uh, Latunsky, you know, to, you know, how he, how, uh, Kevin ended or 
you know, I don't know if should I say his whole name, if it, how, you know, Kevin ended up there to the, the other people that were there. Like the whole thing is just an odd situation, especially the, the homosexual, um, element of it because typically they're like nonviolent it, it you know and this seems really out of character other than the mental illness so honestly even schizophrenics tend to not be violent he oh, is so you know? so and i don't want to you know paint with too broad of a brush here but for any relationship i've ever seen whether it be straight gay whatever regardless of what you know they're orientation is there one is going to fulfill a role of the submissive and one's going to be like the butch that's right couples straight couples that's natural um but and my sister's gay and i see it she's married to a woman and i see it in her relationship and i don't think she'd be mad at me for saying that it's just you know it's a it's reality yeah um jamie arnold was like the more feminine one and latinsky like he was 50 when this happened or 51 and like he he was like he was in shape like he worked out you know he was in pretty good shape but so he was definitely the dominant one jamie arnold as soon as this happened basically disowned him and and said i want no part of this and hasn't talked to the media since um but well he was he must have already been gone though right they, yeah, he had, yeah he yeah he had already filed for divorce and okay. out, yeah yeah when this had happened so how did this kind of start or is there something else leading up to this? So, well, um, there is something leading up to it. Um, November 26th of 2019, this is a month before the murder. Um, I had gotten a tip that, uh, there was a, a guy that had, um, escaped from a basement and he had been chained up in a basement and he was claiming he was drugged. And he took off out of this basement and was running down to railroad. Remember that to railroad. And, um, he was wearing, he was wearing a leather cape. I la later found out that wasn't completely accurate. Um, but he was wearing a leather kilt is what it was. And he took off to this neighbor's house and was just terrified and was telling the neighbor, Oh my God, this guy's trying to kill me. Um, the neighbor's like, okay. And Latunsky actually pulled in to the driveway. I found this out later. It was like, no, 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 this is a big misunderstanding. This consensual, the guy actually went back to his house. Right. And his, his name has never been made public. I do know who it is, but it's never been made public. There's no reason to make it public, but he's from Lance young guy. Um, I think he was a Michigan state student. Um, so this is November 26th. So, so I get a tip on this the night before. So I go into, into the newsroom the next morning. And I call at, at this time you're working for, you're working for a, the, the local newspaper, right? I was a reporter for the Argus press in Owasso. And, um, I covered, uh, the courts and cops beat. So this was, you know, this was my territory. So I go into the newsroom the next morning and I call the Michigan state police, uh, media contact person, um, Dave Kaiser, really, really nice guy never volunteered information but if i knew what i was talking about he'd be like okay you know i'll give you what i have so i called him and i was like hey lt you know i got a tip that there was this weird thing that happened out on tyrell road last year yesterday you know like that's that didn't happen did it he's like oh it happened and i'm like are you serious he's like yeah he's like let me call you back with the report he calls me back like two minutes later and he confirmed it he was like yeah it was a consensual thing gone wrong this one guy got a little freaked out Latunsky was chasing him because he wanted his leather kilt back and this is probably not my finest moment but i was like okay so i hung up and i laughed for about 30 seconds you know not my finest hour and i'm like i'm like what what the hell is going on he's like you make this shit up right and everybody like i did a short little brief maybe 250 words and it was on page two it wasn't even on the front page that's when i sent you and I published this thing and we posted on our Facebook page and it just blows up and you can imagine the comments and, uh, you know, people are like, they're making that up. There's no way it happened. I'm like, it happened. So I file it away and go on to whatever I'm working on next. Well, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, 
like how did the guy end up in the basement? You're saying it was consensual, but Latunsky, this is a, an app of some kind, right? It was the Grinder app. Okay. Yeah. So Latunsky contacted this guy on Grinder, right? And they corresponded for a little bit, and they agree agreed to meet somewhere Latunsky's house, uh, presumably. I mean, I guess you. Yes. Okay. And at some point, they agreed to kind of. You know, the guy agreed to be tied up and he ended up not agreeing to be tied up and kept in a basement, but that's where it ended up. Is that what happened? That's where it ended up. But, um, what MSP, when I say MSP, it's Michigan state police MSP. What they told me is that they said, and I'm paraphrasing, but they said basically when the act was over, Latunsky left him tied up, went upstairs and went to sleep. So this, this guy, is poor guy, bro. <laughs> I mean, how long, and how long did he keep him in the basement? He fell asleep. He doesn't know exactly how long it was. That's what he told the police, but he doesn't know how long it was, and he believed that he had been drugged. Okay. So. So but he did get away. He got away. He got away, but he ended up going back to Latunsky's house, and they continued to do whatever they were doing. So. Okay. All right. So, go ahead. Continue, please. Sorry. So... This is November 26th. I published that story of 2019. Christmas Eve uh, or December 23rd. Um, I had, it was when I found out about a murder. I didn't know anything about it. It had basically broken and the cops had had reported some kind of murder. No details. There was a murder on, on Tyrell Road. And. I had worked late Friday night and I was exhausted and I woke up like I slept in Saturday morning and I never sleep in. I slept in until like 10, 30, 11 o'clock. Like I was dead to the world. And I wake up and it was Saturday, like I said, and I woke up <clears throat> and I had like 30 missed calls, probably 50 text messages from a bunch of people, sources that I knew. And uh, my friend Nikki called, had called me and, I'm, and texted me and she's like, dude, there's a murder out on Tyrell Road, and I'm like, you know, I'm waking up looking at my phone. I'm like, what? I'm like, son of a bitch. So I'm already behind, right? I'm like, damn it. So I get up and I start calling people, and I call Nikki. And she's like, I don't know anything. It's all over social media. It's all over news. Murder on Tyrell Road. No, no details. So that's where I start from. Well, what happened to the other guy that had that um, Latunsky had tied up, and the same thing happened. Right. So I didn't find this out until later, a couple months later, but there was another guy that had escaped from his uh, um, basement in October 2019. Now, this guy, um, we can get into it later, um, and he, he's been publicly publicly identified and tried to sue Mark Latunsky for like emotional distress. His name is James Carlson. He lives in upstate New York. Um, don't search for his Facebook. It's disturbing. But um, he had escaped, and this was in the middle of the night. He had escaped almost identical. BDSM, met on gr uh, Grindr. He, um, he traveled from New York to, you know, come hang out with Mark Latunsky for a few days. To, so be, were, drug, to be drugs tied up, had the uh, a sex act, and he left in the basement. Yes. all Pretty much identical. Like, and then, I, but then escaped. And he escaped as well. It's good to he know that, that it's possible to escape. If if you're in that situation, it's possible. People have done it. So that's <laughs> good. That makes me feel a little bit better. Yeah. Not that I think I'm going to be answering any ads on Grinder, but if someone were to get me in the basement, drug me, tie me up, that there's a chance I could escape. Yeah. So. Well, Latunsky used apparently uh, leather restraints, so they were able. There was some. I don't even know what to call it. There were some knives involved, and he like left them down in. There was this whole sex dungeon that Latunsky had. It's it was insane. Um, yeah, we can get to that a little later. But well, but he that guy called the police also. Yes, he did. He called the cops. MSP responded. He had a knife. He cut himself loose from these restraints. Took off. He he's got the knife. Um, the dispatch call is available on YouTube. Um, you know they're like, okay, when when the cops get there, drop the knife so they know you're not a threat. He's like, no problem, whatever. So the cops come. Same thing. Watunsky doesn't come this time because he's still passed out. And um, cops come. He's like, this was consensual. I'm just freaked out. I want to go home. Now, the problem is, is 
This guy, Latunsky had paid for a bus ticket from New York for this guy to come. His return trip wasn't good for another couple of days, so he's stuck. This guy also went back and stayed with Mark Latunsky for a couple of days until the date that his bus ticket was good. That's risky. I mean, would you go back to that situation? No. I, I like to think I wouldn't. <laughs> but I've done some stupid things. Yeah, well, it, you know. I'd be, I'd tell you, I'd be on edge. I wouldn't sleep well. I wouldn't yeah. be, I wouldn't be taking anything, any food I didn't prepare myself. Yeah. And they were in contact and they were in contact for months and months, um, after, um, he had actually come to stay with, with Mark Latunsky. Wow. So. Terrell Road. Terrell Road. Action. It's a lot of action on Terrell Road. Well, and that's, this is, this is where it all comes together. Like this okay. all happened before the murder. Okay, so you woke up. Sorry, I interrupted. You woke up in the morning. No, it's perfect. You're, you're upset. Like, I'm behind the eight ball. Yep. Yeah. So I start calling people, and I call my friend Nikki. She's like, no details, but, you know, it's legit. It's coming out on social media. Like, the morning news shows, local TV stations had had short things, you know, murder. We don't know anything. We'll update when we can. Standard operating procedure. So I'm like, and I'm just, I'm getting out of bed and I'm pacing around and I'm calling people and I'm like, Terrell Road, Terrell Road. Why does that ring a bell? Nikki calls me back and she's like, dude, that's where the story you did about the guy escaping from the basement. That's the same house. It's the same house. And I'm like, God damn it. It is the same house. So I start calling my people, like my sources, um, you know. I know a lot of people, you, you get to know court staff, you get to know attorneys, you get to know police, um, working at a newspaper covering my beat. So I start calling people and there were still no details. And remember, this is like the dead cycle, Saturday, Sunday for, for a news cycle. And by Sunday night, so late afternoon, early Sunday evening, I had the crime scene, I knew how he had been killed. I knew what his wounds were. I knew where the murder happened. I knew which blow had killed him. It would like, and I knew all the details going to the newsroom Monday morning. Now on Sunday night, I can't sleep because I've been, you know, I'm like, man, I got to file this and I filed it from home and I go into work the next morning and I'm like, I, I told my former um, editor, I was like, dude, nobody else has this. Like nobody else has this. And he, and I, I went into detail in the story I filed about all the details from the murder. And this is like, nobody knows this stuff yet. And he's like, well, who are your sources? I'm like, I'm not telling you my sources. And uh, he's like, well, we're a family newspaper. I'm not going to run this. And I was cursing him out under my breath so bad. So I understand the decision, but at the same time, I'm like, it's only a matter of time until somebody else gets this information and the details and we're going to get beat on it. And oh, by the way, it's your fault when we get beat on it because I told you this morning. Wouldn't run it. So this is Monday morning. So I file my story going to work. He's getting arraigned. Latunsky's getting arraigned. And he, they did it by video conference. There was a lot of safety worries about him physically being transported um, to district court for arraignment. So they did it by video. And it was the strangest thing. We go and it's packed with media. There's like five, six TV stations there. The print people, um, it's full of journalists. They, they had to turn away people um, from the courtroom, actually. So the hearing begins and Latunsky's on speaker. He looks like just this weird, unkempt Viking character. And the judge, the district court judge, um, Judge Clarkson, who I know, he said, sir, it starts off. He said, sir, are you Mark Latunsky? And Mark Latunsky's like, no, Mark Latunsky is my nephew. My name is Edgar Thomas Hill. And like all the media, we're looking at each other like, what is he talking about? They know who he is. And uh, Clarkson's like, well, regardless, we're going to proceed. So the arraignment happens and Clarkson's like, no bond. He, you're not getting out. And um, the public defender was appointed to represent him. 
um, Doug Corwin. He's a good friend of mine. And Corwin, after the hearing, had a press conference and he's like, I'm filing an insanity defense. There's nothing else I can do. Now, these details, which I have to get into, and this is not easy for me to talk about either. Um, Kevin Bacon was the victim. Right. Kevin Bacon was 25. He was a hairdresser from Swartz Creek, small town between Owasso and Flint. Um, he had met up with Latunsky via the Grinder app, noticing a theme here. Right. And um, gone to his house, same thing, BDSM. And Latunsky had killed him. Then cut off um, his testicles, went upstairs. Bacon's obviously dead. Wait a second. Bacon escaped first. No, Bacon did not escape. Oh, Bacon never escaped. He never escaped. Okay, sorry. That's I, I got that wrong. Sorry. I... So he cut off this poor guy's testicles after he's already dead. And he goes upstairs and he goes into his kitchen and he fries them in a frying pan and then eats them. And I had had all these details and wasn't allowed to publish them. Weeks later... Some TV station comes out, and, or so I forget who it was. Somebody else came out and published all the details, and I'm like, I told my editor, I was like, I told you so. And he's like, I couldn't do it. We're a family newspaper. We can now, and I'm like, okay. So the murder happens, and I mean, the the local populace is outraged. Like, this is not who we are. We don't stand for this kind of thing. This, you know, this is horrible and there was a lot of support for, obviously, for Kevin Bacon's family after the murder. And this is where it got political because the gay community is up in arms because of these two guys that had escaped previously. They're like, you know, you could have stopped this. And I understand the argument. But at the same time, it's never been reported that both of these were consensual and both of these guys went back to stay with Mark Latunsky. Right. So, I mean, what do you do in that situation? If you're a state trooper and you respond to that call... You're going to be like, okay, nobody's in danger here, misunderstanding. I want no part of this. Would be my reaction. If I thought somebody was in danger, I'd be like, no way, you're you're coming with me. You know, we'll we'll make sure you're safe. Um, there's a, I don't even know what you'd call them. I think they call them influencers or something nowadays. Um, Jeffrey Star, I believe, is a biological male. Has like a makeup line. He goes on this Twitter just tirade about how we're backwoods, uneducated, you know, biased against gay people, small town, you know. Well, I mean, which, L- Lekunsky was gay and he was mentally ill, so I don't think that has anything to do with, that would have happened whether he was raised in Miami, New York, you know, or, you know, you know, Montgomery, you know, Alabama, like it, it, it it's irrelevant, but right. people are jerks, so. Well, they tried to make a political thing out of it and it really wasn't, it was just a horrible. A mental illness yeah. You know, he's mentally ill. Yeah. So following the arraignment, um, Corwin, the public defender, files for an insanity defense. I mean, that's his only move he had. I get it. Um, they, he was cooked. Latunsky was absolutely done. Um, well, I mean, and they, they, the police came to the house, right? Like, how did the police end up at the house? Okay, so this this is where I kind of like was found myself in the middle of the story. Okay. Like I was I, I I didn't knowingly participate, but I had some bearing on what happened in the story. So there was a preliminary con Watunsky was first found to be incompetent to stand trial, and this took forever. Think of the timing, early 2020, COVID, everything shut down. Every, all the court systems are basically, you know, everybody's getting out on bond and, you know, they're having a court date. We'll tell you when the court date is like courts shut down in Michigan. So a couple months go by, Latunsky's found incompetent. He's down at the Michigan Psychiatric Center in Saline, which is kind of by Ann Arbor. Um, no bond. He's not getting out. So months later, he's found competent to stand trial. So they hurry up and schedule this preliminary hearing, which is like a probable cause hearing. You know, is there enough evidence for this to continue to go to trial? 
And you heard these police officers testify about what they found um, when they went to the house. Now, they went to the house after Kevin Bacon didn't show up for like a family breakfast, like a Christmas Eve breakfast. They went to his house December 28th, I think. So the body had been there for a couple of days. So they have this probable cause hearing, and I'm sitting there, and again, it's a ton of media. And um, after the hearing, um, well, Clarkson ruled, you know, there's enough evidence for this. Um, he, he confessed. There's physical evidence. His DNA was on the frying pan. You know, like his DNA was on the knife. They you found know, he, the body in the basement. Yeah. Um, real quick, let me let me tell you um, a story about the, the body in the basement. So Latunsky had basically created this secret sex dungeon in his basement, and it was somewhat hidden. Um, but when it was Michigan State Police and some township police, the small police department went there for a welfare check, they found Kevin Bacon's body inside this sex dungeon hanging upside down from the rafters. And he had like this counterweight pulley system that he was using like his weightlifting weights to like counterbalance and keep him up in the air. And um, I'll touch on this later, but Latunsky, it was a concrete floor. Latunsky had cut a hole in the floor directly underneath Kevin Bacon's where his body was hanging to drain any <laughs> was left in his body. Like it's dirt underneath this kind. And um, one of the troopers, you know, imagine being one of these poor cops and you walk into that and you're like, oh, my God, that's what he said on the stand. He was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Um, so that's how the troopers found his body. That's what they testified to. So after the hearing, Latunsky is declared competent. He's going to have his day in court. It's going to happen. So everybody walks out after the hearing. I talk to Kevin Bacon's parents. Carl and Pam, really nice people. I talked to his sister and I talked to his roommate. Now, this is where this is where it got weird. His roommate, and I forget, I forget her name, but I asked her, um, I said, Hey, you know, I know you were telling the state police that, you know, he had this grinder date, which Kevin had told his roommate about. You know, I know that they know about that, but um, I did a story a month ago about a guy escaping from the basement, and I think it was Mark Latunsky's house. I said, did you hear about that or know anything about that? And she's like, yeah, actually, I had a friend send me, and that was the screenshot I sent you of the original story I did, that, um, you know, hey, this sounds like it was in the same area, same road, you know, like, I think this is the same guy. And she... um she was like, wow, okay, so she forwarded that to Michigan State Police. And that night that uh, she sent it to Michigan State Police is the night they went to Mark Latunsky's house and found Kevin Bacon's body. And she tells me that, and I felt dizzy. Like, I felt lightheaded. I, and I'm like, I'm like, holy shit, I just became part of this case. Right. So a good friend of mine, Mark Durfee, um, he's the investigator for uh, the uh, public defender's office he comes over after i'm done talking to his roommate and he's like what did she just say to you you look like you just saw a ghost you know and i'm like i'm like i can't talk about it right now i'll tell you about it later read tomorrow's paper and she confirmed that at least in part that the story i'd done a month before that you know state police obviously the troopers who responded already knew about it but the state police were like yeah we're aware of this and you know and i'm not trying to take any credit i'm just saying you know, like I did a story on a murder scene a month before the murder happened. And right. in my opinion, you know, these two guys that escaped, I don't think Mark Latunsky had any plans to kill him. I think what he was doing is a practice run. Yeah, I was going to say they, you know, you build up to it. Yeah, and I, th I think that's what he was doing. I think there were practice runs. Um, you know, mental illness, I can't get in his mind. I've written to Mark Latunsky since he's been in prison. And, you know, I paraphrasing, you know, hi, my name's Josh Champlin. I'm, I'm, I'm a reporter for the Argus Press. I've covered you, your case. I've been at every hearing. I know he's seen me because he'll look you in the eye and you get like cold chills. But uh, basically I said, look, you've been found guilty. You're doing life without parole. Well, he pleaded guilty. 
Um, you're doing life without parole. It's been 45 days, which in Michigan, you have 45 days to submit an appeal. There, you haven't submitted an appeal. There's no way you're ever getting out of prison. You don't have anything to lose by talking to me. I'd like to interview you. I'll come to you. I'll go through whatever security stuff I have to at the prison. I don't care. That's fine. And he never responded. So. That's just rude. <laughs> I I mean, he's never going to get a sentence reduction. No. I wish they had buried him under the prison, honestly. He's never getting out. Um, you know, he's going to die in prison. You know, but, it, you know, if you're him, at least I I can't put myself in his shoes, but I'd be like, well, I might as well tell my life story. You know, he has nothing to lose. He's yeah, not going to get I, I don't think, You know, who, you don't, who knows how his mind's working. I mean, you know, to him, this may be all a part of, um, you know, the government, you know, conspiring against him or you know he probably he, i'm sure he feels no remorse um i mean you've seen the videos of the of the interrogation yep. there's no remorse there he he's got he's tried to convince himself or trying to convince people that he uh that that um bacon or that kevin bacon actually wanted to be to end it for him to end his life you know yeah, he, yeah go ahead th sorry yeah he actually claimed that kevin bacon wanted wanted him him. Right. He said, because, um, and this is public, I wouldn't say it unless it was already public. Kevin Bacon had problems with depression. Um, you know, he was, he was a young man. He just was starting out in life. He didn't really know himself. Um, so he was depressed. Um, whether that had any bearing on what he was doing sex in his sexual life, I don't know, but he was looking for something. And, um, what Tunsky actually claimed and you mentioned the interrogation video, he's sitting there, Latunsky's sitting there like it's the most normal thing in the world for the to, for him to have a guy after he asked him to. He still wants to go back because he has to take care of his dog. I like, was gonna how long mention, is this going to take? I was going to mention that. that He didn't think this was serious at all. Like, he's asking these detectives, One, I only know one of them, I've only met one of the two detectives that were there, but he's like, you know, do you think we can wrap this up soon? I got to go home and feed my dogs or take care of my dogs. And, I, and you're watching this and you're like, this dude is so disconnected from reality. And he's wearing a leather. You can see his leather kilt yeah. in the video. I remember we were watching it. Uh, I was watching it and we were like, what is he wearing? I'm like, is that a dress? And my wife goes, I think that's a kilt. She's like, it was a yeah, it was. A, it was. Um, I was going to say, he also, you know, the detectives, when they start asking him about the cannibalism, about him, you know, eating, how he prepared them, and then he starts saying that his his goal was to turn um, Kevin Bacon into jerky. Yeah, like he had a whole thing on how he was going to consume the entire body to to um, return it to the earth. Like he had a whole thing, and that was that that was Kevin Bacon's his he what he wanted. Do you remember? It was like. So Kevin Bacon, this is according to Latunsky, so take it with a grain of salt. Yeah. He said that Kevin Bacon asked him to and make sure that nothing went to waste. Words to that effect. Now, right after the arraignment, I met with someone who was heavily involved in the case, shall we say. And he, to he, he told me, he said, look, this guy seemed proud of what he had done. He told me he was going to make fertilizer out of his bones and beef jerky out of the flesh off from his body. And and I, I kid you not, immediately following the murder, um, Michigan State Police intercepted a dehydrator that Latunsky had, had ordered after he Kevin Bacon. A dehydrator. So, that, so according to Latunsky... He did. That's that's his justification for saying that he was going to do this with with uh, Kevin Bacon. Yeah, yeah. And and they um, MSP actually searched Latunsky's property for most of a day with like a you know dogs that can detect remains. People and there were these conspiracy theories about how you know he's done this before. He's a serial. <laughs> their bodies buried out there. They never found anything. Yeah. I think probably the first two were trial runs, you know, just to build up his confidence. And then he, he decided to, to 
Kevin Bacon, you know? They, they were, yeah, uh, or to, and it was amateur hour as far as Latunsky goes. I think he wanted to be caught. Um, it, he, a weird, weird thing about this case, and this came out during. Um, More weird than the. Well, just odd. <laughs> It doesn't get any weirder than that, but this came out during the civil cases, and there were two um, that I want to get into. Um, this uh, James Carlson from New York, the first guy that escaped, he, um, it was December 28th, 2019, when the cops came to Latunsky's house. Okay, this is in, this is on Pacer. You can look it up. Uh, James Carlson, C A R L S E N, Eastern District of Michigan. It's all in the filings. And um, Carlson said that on the 28th, he was actually on a FaceTime with Latunsky. And he saw, you know, like you're holding your phone like you do like this. He saw Kevin Bacon's body in the background hanging upside down. Latunsky admitted to Kevin Bacon. And this James Carlson guy is like the actor. You know, what are you talking about? And um, Latunsky didn't answer him. And all of a sudden you hear bang, bang, bang on the door and that was the state police and they were coming to do this welfare check and Latunsky throws his phone on the couch or chair or whatever goes upstairs and James Carlson was on the phone with him when the cops came and arrested Latunsky crazy crazy it's it's all in the court filings if you have a pacer account right but, um okay so what happened after he he eventually ple I mean he get he doesn't he plead guilty or how does, how's that the court proceedings proceed? So there were COVID delays. Um, the court circuit court was shut down for months on end. And then they started doing like zoom hearings. Um, but for this case, like they wanted to be very, very careful. So they didn't give them any grounds for appeal. Like the word was out, you know, be mind your P's and Q's. We are not doing anything to mess this up. We have a confession. We have evidence. Don't give them any procedural reason to get any appeal. Don't do it. So they wanted to be very methodical and very careful about how they prosecuted this case. And they were. Um, so there were COVID delays. Latunsky was incompetent, competent. Then the public defender did their own evaluation. He was incompetent again. Then he was competent again. Um, this thing was scheduled to go to trial last late October, early November. So it was supposed to go to trial about a year ago. And um, it's funny, the uh, county prosecutor, Scott Carter, who I know pretty well, he he was in court and I was covering, this was unrelated, but I was in court covering something. I was, you know, we were on a break and I was like, how's it going, Scott? And he's like, oh, just stressing about the Latunsky trial. And I was like, think about it this way, man. You're going to have lights, camera action. You're going to have every media outlet in Michigan here. You got a slam dunk conviction. You got a confession. Your case is airtight. It's going to, you know, like good for you. It's done. You got it. He's like, yeah, yeah, I guess so. So this whole time, almost three years from 2019 to end of 2022, almost, Watunsky is in the um, psychiatric center. And the, like, that's where you go for um, like a psychiatric uh, evaluation. And you don't leave until they decide one way or another. Um, so he's there the whole time. Now, when you're, it's basically a mental hospital prison. Um, you don't have mail privileges. You don't have TV privileges. You might get a book, you know, you don't have iPads or, or e access to email or anything like that. So he's locked down and, um, he was adamant that he was going to go to trial. And then he fired the public defender as his attorney and hired this woman. She actually defended no, I think that's, he, he ended up hiring um, this um, law firm, high-powered law firm, which was a waste of money. Um, but basically he went to them and to his attorneys and was like, look, I know I've been adamant about going to trial, but I want to plead guilty. I want to hurry up and get to Michigan Department of Corrections so I can have all these privileges. I'm never getting out. I might as well have TV, mail, e you know, email, iPad, whatever. That was his motivation for pleading guilty. So right. he ended up he ended up pleading guilty um, in Michigan. I'm not sure about Florida law, but in Michigan, if you plead guilty to murder, 
the presiding judge has to make a determination whether it's first degree, second degree, manslaughter, you know, accidental death, whatever. And uh, Judge Stewart, uh, Matt Stewart, um, who I know really well, you know, he he was like, "This is this is premeditated. There's there's no way around it. There were two prior incidents. You know, this you're, you're guilty of first degree murder." And he was sentenced. Oh, geez, what was the date on that? Uh, and he was sentenced December 16th of last year. So almost three years to the day um, from when he killed Kevin Bacon, he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. He's never getting out. So. Okay. So what happened with the, um, with the civil trials? Okay. This, okay. <laughs> well, there were two. Um, there was the one that the James Carlson guy filed and it was a federal it was a federal civil suit alleging like emotional distress, a few other things. I feel it was a money grab yeah. uh, or attempted money grab. Um, it, it was just the arguments and briefs by his attorneys were not well written. And I'm not an attorney, but I've read thousands of court files. It was just flimsy at best. And I think it was an attempted money grab. So that one was dismissed because his attorneys actually withdrew because the guy was a habitual liar. Um, you know, he was lying to his attorneys. He was lying to investigators. Um, he was actually scheduled to be subpoenaed for the trial, the criminal murder trial, if it ever happened. But, you know, like had Witunski pleaded guilty, so it was moot anyways. So his case was dismissed without prejudice. So it could be brought again if he can find someone to represent him. He won't. Right. Um, it, it was just a spur spurious lawsuit and it had no merit. It was an attempted money grab. I think he was trying to get Latunsky's family to settle and they wouldn't do it. So that's one of the civil cases, the short and sweet, um, one that's pretty easy um, to explain. The other one was filed by Mark's brother, Paul, Paul Latunsky. Okay. Now I got to rewind a little bit. Paul Latunsky. Okay, so Latunsky was arraigned December 31st, Monday, December 31st, 2019. Okay. He had been in arrears on his mortgage for, I don't know, five or six months or whatever. So he was behind. And um, then, he, then the murder, he was charged with the murder. He's not getting out. So... Basically, the mortgage company it was a small company out of Flint. And like I said, the balance that he owed was like $101,000, $102,000. Um, I don't know what he had already paid on it, but that's what he owed. So the mortgage company was like, we don't want this publicity. Unload this property, sell it at auction. The, in, in Michigan, that's what uh, mortgage companies do. If a house goes in if, or a property goes into foreclosure, then they'll have what's called a sheriff's sale. Mm -hmm. And the pro the county prosecutor is in charge of that. And they'll basically do all the legal filings and paperwork that, that you have to do to auction the thing off. They did an auction. The auction was at um, the circuit courthouse in Corona, which is like the county seat. I believe it was January 20th, 2020 or 21st, maybe right around there. They railroaded this thing through the, sh the prosecutor's office, the sheriff's office were like, we're doing this auction, get rid of this. We don't want any part of this bad PR, you know, auction it, get rid of it. Right. So, and I, I've never seen one expedited to, to that extent before where they rushed it through because, you know, we've got at this point, we've got Buzzfeed, Huff Huffington Post, Rolling Stone is doing stories about this murder case and you know, how we're all bigots and 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 everything and they're like let's get this done with unload it whatever so i go to the auction at the courthouse the morning that it happened it might have been the 25th but it was right in there so i go to the auction and right before i had left i get a call from from a source and i forget who called me but they're like dude there's some domestic thing going out at the latunsky residence i don't know what's going on the cops are there and i'm like this is weird. And I'm like, well, I got to go to the, to the auction. So I sent one of our other reporters out to the Latunsky property. He goes out there 
He comes back. He's like, cops won't talk. Family won't talk. I don't know what's going on. And I'm like, well, okay, uh, I'll mention it in the story. You know, you were there, you saw it. I'll mention it in the story. So before the auction starts, um, it was a guy by the name of Doug Chapman that was doing um, the auction. And he's now the sheriff for Shiawas County. And he was a sergeant at the time. He was basically administrative. He did administrative work for the sheriff's office. Been there for, you know, 25 years or whatever. So I knew him. I knew him pretty well. And I was like, Doug, you know, like I just got a tip. There's some domestic situation, you know, happening out at the Latunsky property. I'm like, do you know what's going on? And he's like, I haven't heard anything. I don't know. If I knew anything, I'd tell you. I'm like, okay. So the auction happens and it was purchased for, you know, 102,000. And the people, the guy that purchased it, his name, he was acting as an agent for his father. The, the kid's name was um, Alex Deal and his dad's name was Stephen Deal. Okay. So they, they bought the property at auction. So I later found out and I was in pretty regular communication with Paul Latunsky. Um, I later found out that maybe 15 or 20 minutes before the auction took place that Paul Latunsky got an emergency order from probate court that named Paul Latunsky as his brother's conservator because it's it's if you're in prison or jail or something or medically you know incapacitated you can have someone set up as your conservator to act on your behalf your it, it, yeah. exactly like a power of attorney kind of a guardian right. Exactly. It's it's almost like a guardianship or a power of attorney. So he got this court order immediately before this auction happened. We're talking across the street from like two different courthouses. What what Paul Latunsky should have done is come over to circuit court to this auction and said, Hey, I got this order. You know, th this auction is illegal, it's invalid, you can't do this. Right. Instead, what he did is he ended up going out to his brother's property where Mark Latunsky's ex-wife and kids were attempting to get in the house to retrieve some personal property, like beds and, you know, whatever. And, uh, Paul Latunsky goes out there and he's like, no, you're not getting in here. What, what his motivations were? I don't know. So they're Mark polishing Latunsky, the, polishing the, uh, brass on the Titanic. I mean, the, <laughs> right. You know, um, so, um, the, Mark Latunsky's ex-wife, um, not her name has been made public. It's Emily. Not that it matters, but she ends up calling um, the sheriff's office. Sheriff's office deputies come out and they tell they tell Paul Latunsky to kick rocks. They're like, if you don't leave, you will be arrested. He's like, wait a minute, I got this emergency order. You can't even be on this property unless I tell you to come on. They can't be on this property. You leave. And they're like, dude, if you don't leave, you're going to get arrested. So he's like, all right, fine. So a couple months down the road. Paul Latunsky files a civil suit against Stephen and Alex Deal. Okay. Stephen Deal was the dad and he's from Fenton and he owns like a used car dealership down there. So he's somewhat well off. Alex Deal is his son. And um, he, Alex Deal moved into this house, like basically broke in, changed the locks they're supposed to wait, I think it's 60 or it could be 90 days. It's called a redemption period in Michigan. Right. Where if, if a house is purchased at auction, like let's say my house foreclosed upon, somebody buys it at auction, I have, I think it's 60 or 90 days. I can redeem, you know, with a certified cashier's check, pay it off to whoever bought it at auction and be like, nope, I'm keeping it. Right. Like that's, that's state law in Michigan. I don't know what it is in Florida. So the deals, um, Paul Latunsky actually... I was told, but I have no way to verify this because he won't confirm it, but I was told that Paul Latunsky borrowed the money from his sister to purchase or pay off the redemption on Mark Latunsky's property. He tried to present payment to the deals three or four times and they refused. So, you know, he's like, the, no, you have to take this check. Um, Alex deal had moved into the house and he was he had like German shepherd dogs and was like breeding them. Again, I can't verify this because he was always, he was always cagey and he lied to me on many, many occasions um, while all this was going on, trying to get favorable coverage in the newspaper. So I was always very skeptical of him and Paul Latunsky. 
Um, they were trying to, you know, milk me for any information I had. And I'm like, I'm not telling you anything. And so Alex Deal would never tell me anything. But um, he was breeding German Shepherds. And I've been told, again, I can't verify this, but that he had sold some of these dogs that he had bred previously to various police departments for use as canine. And he trained them. Like they were very well-trained German Shepherds. And um, basically he trashed the house. They removed, I mean, they ruined the carpets. Um, they removed a lot of the appliances. Um, there was a safe that the Latins that Mark Latinsky had that had like silver, a little bit of gold, a bunch of rare coins that just disappeared. There were people in and out of this property before Alex Deal even moved into it. So Alex Deal is inviting his friends over and basically doing guided tours of this house where this murder scene happened. He later told the media, um, a TV station, he's like, I had to clean, clean up human remains out of the basement. He was given guided tours showing people those human remains in the basement. Whether in what that is, he, he wasn't specific. Alex Deal, Paul Latunsky actually went out there with a shotgun, which you can't do that, while this is all up in the air, right? Like this civil case is going on. Paul Latunsky goes out there with a shotgun, threatens Alex Deal, is like, get out of here. You're not supposed to be here. And Alex Deal took the gun from him, beat the hell out of him. And they, then they dragged Paul Latunsky away for like threatening him with a shotgun and charge him with a felony. The prosecutor's office immediately dismissed the case because they knew what was going on with probate in the civil case. They're like, if we put this guy in jail, he's going to make, he's going to sue us because he had every legal right to be here. And, uh, you know, we don't want that. So they dismissed the cases against Paul Latunsky. Alex deal. It turns out years before, and he's, he, he's not dumb, right? Like he's got a bachelor's degree. I want to say in psychology or something. And he's now a professor at uh, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, UNLV. It turns out, and you can do a Google search on this. MLive did a story on it years ago. Uh, Alex Deal was convicted. He was 19 and the other guy was 18. But he got into some beef with some kid at a party and went home, grabbed a shotgun, went back to this party, shot this other kid in the back, it was loaded with birdshot or the other kid would have been dead if he, if he'd been had a slug or, or buckshot in there. So he wasn't trying to, but he shot this kid. So he's charged with attempted murder and he ends up pleading down to some, you know, nothing charge. He does six months in jail probation and scot free. So, you know, there's the, the mental, mental, uh, state, of everyone involved. Thank you. It's it's all over the all over the place in this case. And um, Stephen Deal, the father, like I had called him for comment when the the case was filed, and I went to all the hearings for the civil case too. And um, I called Stephen Deal. I was like, you know, Alex Deal, your son was living in your in this house, you know, for months and months while all this was going on. He, Paul Latinsky had him evicted and Alex Deal had to, had to vacate the property. And Stephen Deal, I called him and he's like, I can't comment on that. I was like, well, look, he was living there. He told me so himself. He has pictures on his Facebook of him in the house. Right. And Stephen Deal, he's like, I can't comment. You'll have to call my attorney. So I'm like, all right, hang up, call his attorney. And I call his attorney and I forget the guy's name, but. You know, he's like, well, Stephen Deal, he had no idea that Alex Deal was living in this house. And I'm like, I find that very, very difficult to believe. Alex Deal was driving around BMWs with dealer plates on him from his dad's dealership. You're telling me he wasn't in contact with his dad, at least on a semi-regular basis. Come on. They, in the deals, um, Alex's mom, Stephen, ex-wife, like this chick is weird. She was calling me all the time, trying to get me to give up any information that I could about Paul Latunsky. And I was like, look, I don't trust you and I don't trust him. And I'm not telling you anything, you know, like it, where do you feel, you know, <laughs> like I should have to give you anything I know just because you're in a civil case. And she wasn't a defendant in the case. Right. Now, the, the weird thing is 
The civil case was a bench trial. So that's decided by the judge, not a jury. Right. Paul Wotensky testified for, I think, at least two days. And um, Judge Stewart ended up telling me later, he said, you know, Paul Wotensky is the most credible witness I've ever seen in my life. And I have to agree. Like, you know, he had receipts for everything, all the damage that had been done when when uh, Alex Deal was forced out of the property. You know, he trashed the place. It was a tourist attraction for him. That's all it was. It was a free place to stay while his dad paid for it. And Paul Watunsky ended up winning, I believe, he won the case. And Stephen and Stephen Deal tried to get dropped from the case. The judge was like, no way, you're the one who technically bought it, even though your son was acting as your agent. Stephen Deal tried to get dropped from the case. Didn't happen. Paul Watunsky was eventually awarded, and I don't have it in front of me, but it was just shy of a million dollars um, damages plus attorney fees which are not part of the public record, yeah, I would say it pushed it well over a million dollars with attorney fees. Right. So, so what happened after the civil case um, verdict came down is um, Stephen and Alex Deal, and oh, by the way, Alex Deal acted as his own attorney during the civil case. Not, I, I even yeah. asked, like, dude, what are you doing? You know, anybody who represents himself in court yeah, has a full for a full for a client. So and he's like, Oh, I got some tricks up my sleeve. He didn't know what he didn't know what he was doing. So they file an appeal because they don't want this million plus dollar judgment hanging over their heads for the rest of their lives. I get it. So they offered a settlement to Paul Latunsky, and I don't know what that settlement was. I could speculate. But I would say it would probably be a third to a half of that. And that's that's just a guess. Um, you know, like you, it, you're going to take whatever they're going to garnish your wages for for the rest of your life per month. Are you going to take a lump sum payment guaranteed? You know, so. Right. So he. So Latunsky ended up with the house. Paul Latunsky did. Yes. Yeah. So, OK. Whatever happened with the house, they did they just renovate it or bulldoze it or. <laughs> well, that's what most of the uh, residents of Shiawassee County wanted to see it bulldozed to the ground. Um, as far as I know, the uh, Paul Latunsky still owns it. Okay. Te well, Mark Latunsky still owns it, but Paul Latunsky is acting as his conservator and makes all the decisions regarding that property. Good luck renting it out is all I have to say. Um, the thing that bothers me and I've had no communication from the Bacon family, and we talked about this a while back, Is and I'm sure it's difficult for them to talk about, but if they wanted to file, and they have five years, um, that's a statute of limitations to file a civil suit, they could yank, they could sue him. I mean, you got the guilty yeah. plea already. That's as good as gold. You go into a civil case, you know, wrongful death. Like, th they would win. They could easily sue them and pull this property and, you know, salt the earth with it if, if that's what they wanted to do. They have not filed a civil suit. I, I cannot believe they, they haven't filed a civil suit. They, they could easily do it and they could easily win. I've even offered to, because I know a lot of attorneys. Some of my best friends are attorneys. And I've even offered them, you know, hey, I'll introduce you to somebody, you know, th this isn't right. You should have some recompense you know for your loss and they haven't said that any that yes we're going to do it or no we're not interested nothing just no no just nothing no communicado nope no yeah. and like i i was at kevin bacon's funeral like i hugged his mom and she was crying like i had her tears all over my face you know these are wonderful people um i don't want to put their business out there but it's they've since divorced um that's their business, and I'll leave it at that. Um, you know, that might be—I I don't even want to speculate. But, you know, maybe it's not a united front. I, I don't know. But. Okay. All right. Well, anything else you think we haven't touched on? Oh. Um. There was allegedly, um, and this this was a rumor. You gotta you gotta have a good 
bullshit detector um, when you're covering murder cases and high profile cases as a reporter. But there were so many conspiracy theories going around um, during the murder, you know, because this was three years. It was just long and drawn out and it didn't really have to be. Um, it's just every stars aligned to make things as difficult as possible or last as long as possible. Um, the, some of the things, you know, like, oh, there were more victims. No, stop. There were no more victims. This was a very amateurish murder by Latunsky. Um, Doug Corwin, the public defender actually tried to get the charges modified because it was open murder and mutilation of, of a human or a corpse corpse. Okay. corpse. And Doug Corwin actually tried to get the. Uh, charges modified to assisted suicide. You remember Kevorkian back in the 90s? Yeah. Right. So the, he tried to do that, and Mark Latunsky may have potentially seen the light of day outside of a prison somewhere. Um, the judge was like, absolutely not. This is open and shut murder case. No way. So, you know, it, it, like a lot of the things that were said, you know, it, you have one side trying to make it political. You have the other side who's just as outraged. You know, and like none of this has ever been comprehensively reported. Like I've done probably 34, 35 stories on this between the criminal case and the civil cases. And it's like, you'll get bits and pieces and pieces, but you know, like I was in the middle of this thing from the very beginning and even before the case, before the murder case. Right. Well, you're writing a book about it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually submitted a, the, uh, freedom of information act for the complete investigative file actually sent it Sunday, which doesn't count because it's not a business day. Um, but it was received on Monday and I submitted it to the prosecutor's office and, uh, Scott Kerner actually called me, um, a couple hours ago and he said, he's, he's like, there's like 4,000 pages. It's going to cost a good amount. Right. You know, it's going to be about 12, 1300 bucks. And I'm like, wow, if that's, that's what I got to do, that's what I got to do. He's like, well, is there anything in particular you want? I was like, I want everything you got. And I'm not going to publish, you know, pictures of, of Kevin Bacon's body in a book. I would never do that. Um, I have enough respect for the family and decency, frankly, to not do that. Um, you know, but at the same time, I want to see everything that they have. Um, and, and the book's coming along slow. We, we discussed this. Um, I'm trying, I'm trying something new, taking some of the advice you gave me. Um, it's, it's coming along slow. I hope to have it ready for proofs and review by legal counsel by the first of the year. Cause I don't want to get sued. Um, I've never had a retraction and I've never been sued, but, uh, I hope to keep that streak going, but, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's coming. Um, Scott did tell me there are other people that have submitted requests, so I'm not the only one um, who's doing something. I'm just the only one who's publicly said um, right. something. But the judge in the case, Judge Stewart, he told me, you know, a year and a half, two years ago, he was like, you need to write a book on this. Like, the, there is no one in a better position than you. Like, you're the, you were the Cub beat reporter when that started. Um, you know, like I, I was at the paper for five years. He's like, you need to write a book on this. You were in the middle of everything. You know, right. everybody involved in the case. Um, the one glaring weakness that I'm going to have is that I never got the chance to talk to Kevin Bacon. Well, no one else did either. Right. And, and it's a shame. Well, mm -hmm. you do have the, the, you're going to, you'll get the tape, the, um, interrogation tape. Yeah. You know, you can glean I, some from some things from that. Well, I already have audio of that. I was at the hearing and they played the whole thing at the. I have okay. that. And, and just, just to, just an, a quick aside and nobody's ever reported this. And I was, I was, I wanted to in a story and I'm just like, this is bad taste. This is just something I observed from a hearing in circuit court. So if there's no jury present for a proceeding, they'll let the press sit in the jury box. It's pretty cool. Comfortable seats. Good view. So. I was at a hearing in circuit court. Mark Latunsky's there in person. His defense attorneys are there, prosecutors are there, courtrooms packed. And they're playing this confession to two Michigan State police detectives. And he he's he gets into the part where he's talking about the BDSM 
stuff that they got into and graphic violent acts and he basically Kevin Bacon had two stab wounds to the back of his neck, a superficial one across his throat, and then the one that was the cause of death across his throat. And he's talking in, in the, he's watching himself on this video on this huge TV describing how he killed Kevin Bacon. And he's sitting there with his legs crossed and he was like a stone during all court proceedings I've ever been to with him. He sat there and he was like a potted plant, except when it, when they played this tape of his confession, he started tapping his feet and like bouncing his feet and you, his eyes got big and he was looking up at the screen and it was like, what is going through your mind right now? And I was, I was just like, it, it was, I don't even, I don't even want to think about it, but there was some kind of activity when he was watching himself talk about someone. It, it, it blew my mind. It blew my mind. It did. Did you ever figure out why he said like he, he wasn't Mark Latinsk, uh, Mark, uh, Latusky? Latunsky, yeah. He, Latunsky, sorry, uh, at the preliminary hearing, like, yeah. So obviously part of it was mental health, but he had taken on this online persona with this profile that he had. And there were, there were all these websites called like rent men, you know, and these are like escort services. He started calling himself, it was like Vilco, Olikos, Vilkos. Now, each of those words means wolf in like Polish, Greek, Lithuanian, I think. And like he was, he told the investigators when he was being interrogated, he's like, you know, whenever there's a new moon, I like to eat Rocky Mountain oysters. You know what those are. So he, I think he had like this, this strange fixation with like Norse mythology mixed with God knows what else. And it's just, I just, I don't think he had any idea what, obviously his mind was warped and I'm not a psychologist. I can't, I can't describe this in great detail, but he was obviously not a well-adjusted human being, but at, but at the same time, he was also highly intelligent. Yeah. And it's just, He'll, he's the only one that knows the question of that. He's not talking. Right. So that's, that's another regret, but you know, the only thing, the only word he ever said besides when he claimed he was someone else in any court proceeding was no, that's the only word he ever said. Do you have anything you want to say? No. Or he said yes. When he pleaded guilty. Okay. Yes. No, that, those are the only two words he ever said in court. No remorse, no emotion. Okay. And it's just, it's tragedy. You know, this poor 25 year old kid, he's, he's gone. So, all right. Well, I, I appreciate you, um, you know, taking the time to talk to me about this. No problem. It's, uh, super interesting, disturbing. I, I lived it, man. I, I've had some bad dreams, you know, like I, my first day at the paper, my former managing editor told me, he's like, look, you're going to be covering court stuff. There's going to be some things you're going to hear that are not going to be easy to hear. And I'm like, yeah, right. You know, you go in and you cover these, it's called criminal sexual conduct in Michigan, kitty diddlers. Yeah. You hear like a six-year-old go have to go up on the stand and testify about what so-and-so did to her. And it just, you, you, it's, it's disheartening. It is. Yeah. And though, honestly, the murder, Kevin Bacon's murder was horrible, but that's, you know, it's, it's, it's horrible. Some of the things you hear in court and I don't ever, ever plan on writing a book about that. So. Right. Hey, I appreciate you guys watching the interview. And if you liked it, do me a favor and subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, hit the bell. So you get notified of videos like this. And leave me a comment in the comment section. Also, please consider joining my Patreon or buying one of my true crime books. All of the links are in the description. I really appreciate it. See ya.